I have all these things in my head, things I want to say, things I think is your father you'll need to hear. You're going to find that there are people in this world, people who you are going to look at and say, why is this person like this? I find myself surrounded by people who will do or say anything just for the appearance that they are better than they are. Hey, my name is Calvin B. Fisher. I'm an author, and I also like to cover games, particularly their stories. This video is about Ultimate Spider-Man. There are games with better combat. There are games with better worlds. There are games with a greater combination of these elements than Ultimate Spider-Man has. Ultimate Spider-Man may not be the best game of all time. However, I think it's the best game adaptation of a property that I've ever played, and I can't think of a whole lot that come particularly close. Ultimate Spider-Man is an adaptation of the comic book of the same name, a comic whose original run ran from 2000 to 2011. It was an incredibly influential comic for many reasons, and Spider-Man adaptations to this day take inspiration from it. This game is the pinnacle example of taking those comic book pages and bringing the characters, the world, and the life of the comic into a different medium. This game is the most authentic translation from another medium into video game format that I have seen. I cover a variety of games on this channel and break down their storytelling. So, I guess you could categorize me as a variety channel rather than a franchise specific channel. Because of that, I don't really claim to be a lore expert on all the games I cover. With my Halo Reach video for instance, I would not classify myself as an expert on Halo lore by any means, even though I was breaking down the storytelling techniques. Spider-Man is different. I've been living and breathing Spider-Man ever since I was a little kid. I've read countless comics by countless creators. Spider-Man comics are what inspired me to become a writer. As a kid, I used to write a whole bunch of comics and go around my neighborhood and try selling them to my neighbors. Some of my biggest influences in my own writing, and just life I guess, come from Spider-Man comics. That especially includes the works by J. Michael Straczynski, Paul Jenkins, and Brian Michael Bendis. Peter Parker is my favorite character of all time, and the Ultimate Spider-Man comics were a huge part of that. I think I've read every volume many, many times. Even though I haven't read the Ultimate comics in a few years, I can still list out every single volume and what happens by memory. Peter Parker, especially Ultimate Peter Parker, was my hero growing up. I mean, it may sound like I'm trying to flex my Spider-Man knowledge and fanaticism, but that's not my point really. I think, when you're a big fan of something, you can get more sensitive about the small details, right? For instance, with Star Wars, a whole lot of fans notice small issues and inconsistencies that I wouldn't pick up. I'm that same way with Spider-Man. I'm very sensitive to when things are out of character, or when details don't quite feel right. I can get particular sometimes, let's say. And this is all a long roundabout way of saying that if this game screwed with Ultimate Spider-Man and made it not feel authentic, I would be very keen to pick up on it. That said, this game is so incredibly impressive because it feels so authentic. It feels like the comics, ripped out and coded into 3D form. I'm going to go over this game and break down all the little details that go into it, and explain just how it manages to bring the comics to life in a brand new form. This video is a love letter to a game that I adore, a set of stories that I love, and a hero that I love. And what's a better way to start a love letter than with a personal story? Ultimate Spider-Man was my first ever T for Team game, and I remember that very distinctly because there's a funny story behind it. Growing up, my parents didn't allow me to play T-rated games until I became a teenager. And when this game came out, I wasn't anywhere close to being a teenager. They were being good parents by caring about what I consumed as a kid, but man, it was painful. As I mentioned earlier, the Ultimate Spider-Man comic was my favorite thing in the world, so having to watch this game come out and not being able to play it was agonizing. So, I had to content myself with the Nintendo DS and Game Boy versions, which both had a lower maturity rating than the console version. I watched for years, just hoping that I could one day play the game. Then one day, my mom took me to GameStop. I perused the shelves for games idly. And then I found an oddity. I found a copy of Ultimate Spider-Man for PS2 on the shelf. But miraculously, there was a misprint on the cover. The game copy had an E for Everyone rating on it. To this day, I still have no idea why or what happened. I've never seen a copy of a game with a misprinted rating on it. I mean, imagine finding a copy of Call of Duty with an E for Everyone rating. That would probably make the news. Everything else about the copy was the same. The authentic cover and backplating. It wasn't some dinged up used copy with a generic cover slapped on. I couldn't believe it. 
I held the case, hands trembling with this miracle, and I showed it to my mom. She read the rating, saw that it was E for everyone, and bought it for me. So we drove home, me just staring at the game case. I felt a potent mix of emotions. I was just about as excited as I had ever been in my short life, but I was also feeling monumentally guilty for deceiving my mom. When I got home, I put the disc in and started playing. I got through the first couple of levels, and the game was everything that I had ever dreamed of. But still, I couldn't shake the guilt I felt. Eventually, it became too much. By the time I reached the first Venom level, I fessed up to my mom. I explained that the game was actually T for team, but the case had a misprint. I said she could return it if she wanted, but my mom was impressed with my honesty. So instead of returning the game right away, she sat down and watched me play. After watching me for a bit, she determined that the game was appropriate enough for me. I mean, I had read and experienced so much Spider-Man content up until this point. So she let me keep the game. The hard T for teen rating loosened up a bit after that, but I still remember that memory fondly. Okay, so I know that story is a tangent, but I think it's a good one. I guess, point being, that I have a lot of nostalgia wrapped up in this game, and I can't honestly fully separate myself from it. But having played it again now, about 20 years past its release, I stand firmly by my opinions, and I even have a newfound appreciation for the game. With that, let's start at the beginning. Ultimate Spider-Man begins with Peter Parker narrating events from the comics, specifically the events from Volume 6 Venom, which comprises issues 33 through 39. And well, if you're trying to make a comic book leap off the page, what better way than starting with a story right from the comic? It does a better job of summing up the events from the comics than I could, so I'll just let the intro play out. This is how it all began. Which, of course, leads to nonsense like this. A few months ago, I reunited with my childhood friend, Eddie Brock. What is that? It's our inheritance. Eddie's dad and my dad worked together before they died. We believe the suit may be the final step. Finally. A cure for cancer. People are dying all over the world. And all I want to do is try to help them. But because I signed the wrong paper for the wrong person, I can't. They had taken the suit away from Dad, and I was going to take it back. I thought, I knew. I could finish what he started. I felt good. Great. More than myself. It didn't last. What's happening to me? Get this off of me! I don't know what the suit had become or what it had done to me. But I have super spider powers, and I couldn't control it, so I don't think anyone could ever hope to. But when Eddie found out what I had done, who I really was, well, he was pretty angry. There's a few things I want to note about this intro. First off, I think the voice of Peter is spot on for this game. Sean Marquette really sounds like a teenager, and he delivers a specific snarkiness that I think is especially characteristic of the ultimate version of Spider-Man. But more than that, the dialogue is perfect for Peter. In the comics, he has a lot of inner monologues where he talks back and forth with himself, so you get an acute sense of how he talks and the idiosyncrasies that come along with that. It's a hard thing to get a character's voice right, but this game does it perfectly. And that's no coincidence. The writer of the Ultimate Spider-Man comics, Brian Michael Bendis, also wrote this game. So there is this perfect parody between his vision writing the comics and the vision of this game. The next thing that immediately sticks out is the art style. The art style of Ultimate Spider-Man is iconic. Comic books are known to cycle through artists frequently, but Brian Michael Bendis and the penciler, Mark Bagley, actually set the record for the longest consecutive writer-artist partnership. Mark Bagley is my favorite comic book artist, and he has a very unique style. The game's visuals are directly modeled after his work. 
Added to that is the cell shaded coloring of the game. The game looks like Mark Bagley's art, ripped directly off the page and rigged up to move. So in a sense, this game has the same creative core, the same visual style and writing as the comics. And that just makes the game ooze with a sense of authenticity. It doesn't stop there though. The cinematic direction of the game also emphasizes the comic book inspiration. The story is often told through comic panels, animated and moving on the screen. All this added together really sells this game as an extension of the comic book. I'll delve more into these details later. But since we're not even out of the intro yet, I've got to keep it moving. The intro cutscene ends with the panel ripped directly from the comics where Peter and Venom first meet. This panel, placed directly before the gameplay begins, is a declaration more than anything else that this game is a comic embodied. Peter and Venom face off in his high school's football field. Rain is pouring. The sky is purple and sickly. The player is introduced to the game's controls as Peter slugs it out with Venom. It's an intense start. This fight is a direct adaptation of issue 38 of the comics when Peter faces Venom. The fight starts on the football field, then moves to the streets. So too does this brawl with Venom. In the cinematic, Rainfall bleeds out of the comic panel. I really like this touch, and it's used throughout the game. Having world elements like Rainfall bleed out of the borders really sells this feeling that the game is taking place in a comic book, but bursting out of it to life and movement. It belies a kineticness and energy. When Peter gets to the streets, he's swallowed by Venom. The minigame to mash buttons to complete a strength event is introduced. This is taking a moment from the comics, where Peter is consumed by Venom and meshing it with gameplay to form a tutorial. It's really well done and speaks to how the game combines its comic roots and gameplay almost seamlessly. After a bit more brawling, Venom gets shot at by the police. He steps too close to an electrical wire and gets shocked into oblivion. That's the end of the tutorial. This also marks the end of the game directly adapting stories from the comics into the game's narrative. From here on out, the game's story is wholly original, serving as a sequel to this Venom arc. I really appreciate this approach as starting with direct adaptation followed by original story. Starting with a direct adaptation gives players a familiar footing in the world and really sells you on this game being part of the same continuity as the comics. However, if the game dwelled on the comic stories too much and was, let's say, a pure adaptation of the game's stories, where you were just reliving events you had already experienced, I think you would end up comparing this story to the way it was told in the comics. By blossoming the comic story into a further continuation, the game similarly gets to blossom with its own narrative without such direct comparisons. Three months pass by, and we're in Peter's shoes. He's in high school, attending Midtown High. Mary Jane Watson has done the decency of repairing a Spider-Man costume and he has to go pick it up. We're introduced to some new game mechanics as Peter heads back home. When he grabs his web shooters, he hears that Shocker is robbing a bank. I love this, because you can just see the annoyance on Peter's face. The Shocker's a villain that pops up a lot in the comics, and he's a running gag, for the most part. More on the Shocker later. First, Peter needs to get his Spidey suit from MJ. He's not going to take on a supervillain in his school clothes now, is he? The web swinging feels smooth, really smooth. There's a kineticness and power to his swings, and the sense of momentum really carries through. Since we're in Queens, the buildings are pretty short, so your ability to swing is a bit stunted. It gets better in Manhattan. Peter meets MJ. You may be thinking to yourself that it's a bit weird that MJ asked Peter to meet at some weird broken down warehouse. The thing is though, this warehouse has significance in the comics. It's Peter and MJ's secret meeting spot. It's attention to detail like this that really adds up. Once Peter gets his suit, he heads out to fight the Shocker. As I mentioned, the Shocker is a joke villain. Spidey gives him a quick trouncing, usually by webbing up his gauntlets, then goes about his business. With this backstory in mind, it's perfect that the Shocker was chosen as the tutorial villain for Spider-Man's web abilities. It's a perfect use of the world and story in order to communicate gameplay mechanics. Characteristically, the Shocker goes down easy. However, this isn't the last we'll see of this style-lacking goon. Ultimate Spider-Man has city events, which are random events that pop up on the map every couple of minutes. They are generally mundane hero activities, like helping save someone hanging off a building or stopping a petty crime. But every once in a while, the Shocker will show up as a randomized villain to fight. You'll be swinging around the city, heading to the next mission or combat challenge, and you'll come across the Shocker committing a crime. You take him out pretty quickly again and head about your business. 
So your encounters with the Shocker mimic Spidey's encounters with him in the comics. It's an awesome and funny use of game mechanics to sell the world and again sell this idea of the comics coming to life. Boomerang is another supervillain that randomly shows up in these encounters. After the Shocker is taken care of, Peter heads back to school. He runs into the human torch of the Fantastic Four. He challenges Peter to a race. This is emblematic of the petty friendship slash rivalry they share in the comics. Peter takes him on. We race the human torch through various obstacles and trounce him pretty easily. As the human torch, at least he's used to getting roasted. Like the city events, races are another activity that can be found throughout the city. So, this race with the human torch is a tutorial, just like the shocker crime. It would have been easy to make these tutorials very generic and boring, but Ultimate Spider-Man breathes life into them through clever uses of in-universe characters and lore. It makes the tutorials fun and memorable. This isn't the last encounter with the Human Torch either. The Baxter Building, which is the Fantastic Four's home, sits right in Manhattan. It's cool to be able to swing past the building and know it's where the Human Torch lives. It grounds the character in the world. And when enough races are conquered, you meet the Human Torch at the Baxter Building for increasingly challenging races. So, again, it's cool how the main story's events and characters bleed out into the open world and its activities. It unifies everything and makes the game feel like one cohesive whole. After the race is completed, we're alerted that city goals need to be completed before advancing to the next mission. Between each mission in the game, a certain number of random city events and races need to be completed. In addition to these goals, a certain number of collectible tokens need to be found, and combat tours need to be beaten. Combat tours are exactly what they sound like. You need to defeat packs of enemies along predefined routes. Some people take issue with the city goals that block off the main missions, since it's artificial padding to extend the game's length. I get the argument, believe me I do, but it doesn't really bother me. And that comes down to a few things. First of all, these city goals took me a maximum of 5 minutes between missions. And I do mean maximum. So if it's padding, I mean it isn't much. When I think of padding in games, I think of it taking a half hour to hours to push through random slock before getting to the interesting stuff. Second, I think all the activities are fun. The races are a blast because the swinging and movement mechanics feel so good. The combat tours are satisfying and provide the game's real combat challenges. The city events are novel and interesting for the most part, and they can generally be beaten in like 30 to 60 seconds. The open world and activities are a large part of the game so I don't see anything wrong with the game encouraging you to do those activities in principle. I mean, you could argue about whether token collection is fun or not, but you need to collect so few tokens, and they're so prevalent, that you'll stumble across all the tokens you need without having to actively hunt them. And, since I'm on the topic, some of the tokens unlock cool stuff. One type of token unlocks the comic covers for you to look at, which I think is awesome, and it further ties the game to its comic origins. Lastly, and maybe this sounds dumb, but I think the city events really get you into the mind of Spider-Man. Swinging across the city and saving people from danger and patrolling for crime is the quintessential Spider-Man experience. It just feels right, I guess, to save a couple of people between hunting down Venom or throat-punching the Green Goblin. And that's the main reason I mentioned these city goals, actually. I think it gets you into the headspace of the character by having to act how Peter would. This city is bubbling with cool details. There are landmarks like the Baxter Building. Another one I really like is all the Craven the Hunter posters littered throughout the city. In the Ultimate Comics, Craven is a celebrity more interested in media and the glamour of it all, so having these movie posters is an awesome little nod to him. These cameos, aside from just being fun, do a great job of fleshing out the universe and making it feel bigger than just Spider-Man in his rogues gallery. The Ultimate Comics line has a lot of other series, such as the Ultimate X-Men, so getting to see characters like Wolverine really reminds you of that. With all the city events done, it's time to head to the next main mission. This mission is a bit different though. This time, we take control of Venom. That's right, in Ultimate Spider-Man, you don't just play as Spider-Man. The game has almost as much focus on Venom. We see the end of Peter's battle with Venom. A man named Adrian Toomes is watching from the sidelines, and he takes a keen interest in the symbiote. It's Toomes. Now listen. Listen to me. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Queens, and I... Listen! I saw the suit. You heard me. Yes! The suit! We find out Venom has survived, and has been keeping alive by consuming civilians. 
The game goes through a tutorial of Venom's controls. It's clear from the very outset that Venom isn't just a reskin of Spider-Man. He has entirely different gameplay mechanics. The web swinging ability is replaced by a giant jump. Venom launches into the air and comes crashing down like a comet, shattering the pavement. Venom can climb up walls, but he does so by clawing into the bricks, shearing off parts of the buildings and leaving marks in his wake. Overall, the game really sells the bestial vicious nature of the character just by how he moves. The same extends to combat. Instead of punches and kicks, Venom claws at his enemies and whips tendrils around. He picks up enemies and smashes them into the ground or crumples them up like soda cans. I'll go more into the combat later. Next, we're introduced to the biggest gameplay difference between Spider-Man and Venom. The Venom symbiote is slowly consuming Eddie, and this is represented through gameplay by his health always steadily decreasing. To get his health back, he has to feed on enemies and civilians. The game introduces Venom's first target, a kid holding a balloon. Now, having him feed on a kid may seem pretty dark, but it's also black humor. It's a callback to the developer's previous game, the tie-in for Spider-Man 2. That game had similar random city crimes and events to stop, but there is one event that lived in particular infamy. There was a kid who would always lose his red balloon. He would shriek and cry in a really irritating way, and Spider-Man would have to hunt down the balloon, which was also irritating to try and catch. So, this kid and the balloon were notorious. This kid in Ultimate Spider-Man is Treyarch playfully poking fun at their prior game and giving players some level of payback for the amount of times they had to deal with the balloon kid. When Venom eats the kid, you see that balloon float away. Venom decides to chuck a motorcycle into a bar in the pursuit of more victims. Boy, did he pick the wrong bar. The famous X-Man, Wolverine, just happens to be chumming it up in that same bar. Venom hasn't sated his appetite yet, so naturally he and Wolverine square off. Like the prior cameos, Wolverine's appearance adds to the feeling that the world is bigger than what you see in the game. There's an entire ecosystem of superheroes, supervillains, and organizations, and all the rest, and we just get a taste of that here. Once Venom is thrashed, we return to Spider-Man's perspective. The next mission starts with MJ and Peter studying in the library. She hears that the rhino is on the loose and tearing up the city, so she pushes Peter to go out and stop him. I just want to point out the artistry of this cutscene. Particularly, I mean the framing, use of silhouettes, and the use of font and text. You could take a screenshot of multiple frames in this scene, slap them into a comic, and they wouldn't look a hair out of place. When Spidey arrives at the scene, the city has already been thoroughly trashed. Flaming buildings, broken trees, the whole nine yards. Spider-Man follows in Rhino's wake, rescuing civilians that got caught up in the wreckage. One thing Ultimate Spider-Man does that I really appreciate is that there's an emphasis on saving people. The first half of this mission is primarily Peter helping people. It's what being a hero is all about. But in superhero games, there's often a lack of focus on the hero part of that. All of this wreckage and calamity is a nice buildup of suspense to Rhino's appearance. You see all the damage this guy is capable of, and you know your butt will be right in front of him soon enough. When Spider-Man does confront Rhino, a cutscene plays. Rhino is bursting out of the comic panels, and this does a great job of communicating his sheer size. He slaps Spider-Man, and Spider-Man goes flying through panel after panel. Again, the use of comic framing communicates how much power is behind the blow. After saving some more people, Spider-Man finally confronts a rhino in a construction yard. We see comic paneling used to great effect again. It is used to highlight areas of interest and cue the player into how to defeat Rhino. The panels are a great synthesis of serving as gameplay prompts, while also feeling like they fit perfectly in-world, enhancing the feeling that you're playing a comic book. Spider-Man tricks Rhino in getting his fist stuck into concrete, and he slams a wrecking ball into him. It hurts Rhino, but he's not down for the count. Spider-Man then chases him into a car dealership, where the boss fight begins in earnest. The dealership is a great arena, primarily because of the cars. Rhino has a fondness for picking them up and chucking them at Spider-Man. The thing is, though, the cars have their own internal logic. If they take too much damage, they explode. So if the Rhino launches a car at you and it detonates next to another car, it can trigger a chain explosion. It adds a level of dynamism to the fight. But further than that, it also makes the rhino feel even more powerful. When you're dodging a car careening at you like a bullet, and it smashes into more cars and blows them up, let me just say you can feel the power of your opponent. 
Spidey's trickery left a weak spot in Rhino's armor. When an opportunity opens, Spidey smashes the weak point and takes his enemy down. When the rhino is finally toppled, Spider-Man observes a Trask Industries logo on his boot. The name strikes him as familiar, but he gets distracted as the rhino's husk opens. Trask. Trask. Why does that name seem so familiar? (laughs) Back away from me, Master Avenger! My diminutive corpus will not withstand your contumelious defeasance! Not with the big words again! (laughs) Time to abscond this locus! After all the damage and destruction Rhino has caused, this sudden diffusion of all sense of threat and intimidation is pretty funny. Spider-Man webs him up for the cops and bugs out. Spider-Man's head starts to hurt, but he chalks it up to taking a beating from the Rhino. The real cause, though, is that Eddie is walking along the streets below. The next mission is Venom-focused again. He's being hunted by a mercenary group led by Silver Sable. The mercenaries spring into action, and Eddie has to fight them off. This mission is pretty much just Venom pounding on the mercenaries and sending them packing. So, this is a good time to delve a bit more into combat. I'm not going to do a full review or breakdown on how it works as a system. Mainly, I want to touch on how each combat system incentivizes you to play like the character you're controlling. That may sound somewhat obvious, but let me explain. Spider-Man can use a variety of moves in battle. Punches, kicks, and grapples, wall attacks, webs, etc. Also built in as a combo system. When you get a higher combo, your attacks do more damage. So, the player is incentivized to get a higher combo. Higher combos are achieved by alternating between punches and kicks and alternating targets. The combos are somewhat limited. You have a maximum of 5 normal attacks, and the use of grapples and wall hits can extend it a little bit. But, the combos can't be chained indefinitely at least not in a way I've discovered. You're not going to be juggling the same guy for 2 or 3 minutes in a chained combo. At the same time, there isn't a dedicated dodge button in the game. The primary way to avoid damage is by jumping out of the way of attacks and getting away from the action. Your attacks when jumping are dive bomb style attacks designed to get Spider-Man right back into the action. This all combines into a distinctive combat loop. Spider-Man jumps into the fray, bouncing between enemies with an acrobatic mix of punches and kicks, before vaulting into the sky and coming crashing back down. You could just mash the punch button and call it a day. However, the game incentivizes you into this bouncy mode of combat. Essentially, the game gets you to fight in a way that is very characteristic of Spider-Man. You get into Spider-Man's headspace and start to act as he would. The same goes for Venom. When fighting as him, there isn't the same combo system. You're not incentivized to play cute. Instead, Venom's claw strikes and tendrils are brutal. Enemies don't need to be hit many times with them. Usually one claw strike is enough to send an enemy reeling. You feel an even greater power than you do with Spider-Man. However, this is paired with an ever-decreasing health. This primes the sense of survival in the player. Even as Venom is throwing tanks around, the player knows that with each passing second, they are closer to death. As such, it makes the player constantly study their environment, looking for the next victim to sate Venom's hunger, if only for a couple minutes. So, the combat really gets the player into the bestial survivalistic mindset of Venom. With all that said, while the combat is simplistic, I think it encourages you into the headspace of the characters. And in that sense, it works to reinforce the characters. So, back to the mission. Venom trounces Silver Sable's mercenaries and sends them packing. A cool detail about this level is that it takes place in the same area as Rhino's rampage. You can actually see the holes in the wall where Rhino busted through. That isn't where this cool detail ends. As the game progresses, and even after the story's conclusion, the area will get steadily repaired, with you able to see different stages of development as you swing by. This is such an awesome attention to detail, and it really goes above and beyond. It helps sell the world as this living, breathing place. And it also highlights the importance of the main story by leaving tangible marks of it on the world. Venom and Peter are on a collision course, and they finally clash with one another. Peter and MJ are at the museum, and his spider sense suddenly goes haywire. Eddie is on the scene. They face off on the rooftop of the museum, with Peter's head only getting worse. Eddie? Oh my god! You... I thought... my head! It's killing me! What's going on? Just, just being near Eddie is, 
The fight is pretty similar to the tutorial mission. Both Spider-Man and Venom have extended abilities than their first encounter. The main differentiator, though, is the headache Spider-Man feels. They're random, and they break up your flow. You'll lose control of Spider-Man, and you'll get hit even without making an error. You really share Spider-Man's frustration and his helplessness, as your falling victim does headaches too. The fight, then, doesn't feel much like a dance. Rather, it feels like a drag-knuckle brawl, with both Spider-Man and Venom taking heavy blows. Venom feeds on Spider-Man too if you give him the chance, further extending the fight by healing Eddie. Even though you get the best of Eddie, the fight starts to go south. Luckily for Peter, and very much unluckily for Eddie, Silver Sable and her goon show up. They capture Eddie and drag him into their ship. They bug out, not giving Spider-Man the courtesy of an explanation. Peter is a bit disturbed by his headache experience, so he does some research. He and MJ take a look at his blood under the microscope. They discover some oddities. What are those black things? Yeah, that's the I have no idea part. It looks like his headaches are connected to the Venom symbiote. No question about it. This is a good break point for me to, as always, push my book. I'm a science fiction writer, and the largest inspiration behind that was the stories I read about Spider-Man. My series is a post-apocalyptic thriller centered on a man who wants to do right, but finds himself in continually darker and darker situations. The man he has ordered to kill becomes the man he has to save, and the fate of the world rides on his success. If you read this series, I'm sure you'll see some Peter Parker DNA in the main character, although he is a different character with his own unique goals, desires, and faults. There are two books out in the series, with the third coming out soon. I'm writing the fourth and final book right now. I think one of the most important parts of the story is landing the ending, and I'm feeling pretty excited about how things are wrapping up. You can find the link to my books in the video description, in my channel info page, or you can just look up kelvinfishermedia.com. So if you like Spider-Man or if you like sci-fi, I really encourage you to check it out. It's the number one way you can support me. Eddie Brock wakes up in a cell. He is met by Adrian Toomes and the main man, Bolivar Trask himself. They want Eddie to test the suit. It's worth millions in government contracts, and they want to see what it can do. They're fully aware that the suit is consuming Eddie. If he's left in the cell, the suit will kill him. Eddie has no choice but to comply. He is trotted out into the city, and Electro is hired to give him a run for his money. As Electro himself mentions, his hiring makes perfect sense. Venom has a vulnerability towards electricity, so what better guy to keep him in line than Electro? Venom chases Electro through the streets. Electro has no qualms throwing lightning bolts at him and taunting him. The insults in Electro's smug tone really encourage you to catch up to the villain and give him a pounding. You gotta keep up, boy! Going down! An interesting little detail about the chase, too, is that if Electro gets too far ahead, he'll stop and wait for Eddie to catch up. So, it's harder to lose this chase by falling too far behind than some of the other chases. It makes sense narratively. Electro isn't trying to lose Venom, he's trying to test him. It's not long before our favorite wall crawler catches wind of this escapade and arrives at the scene. Electro manages to get a lucky blow on him. Spider-Man falls, down for the count. This sets up an interesting dynamic where Venom is actively defending Spider-Man as he slugs it out with Electro. It keeps Venom from straying too far from the scene. If you go too far away, Electro will seize the opportunity and start to fry Spider-Man. So this fight creates an interesting balance between fighting Electro, hunting civilians to replenish your health, who don't like to be too close to the action, and preventing Electro from killing your enemy. Once Electro is beaten down enough, he siphons energy from a Jumbotron screen and enters his powered up phase. Now, Venom has to disable Electro's powered up state before he can attack him, either by spraying him with water via fire hydrant or beaming him with a car. Either stuns Electro, and Venom is free to pummel him a bit before Electro recovers. There's another wrinkle to this fight though. Electro can replenish his health by siphoning energy from the big screen's littering Times Square. So in order to put Electro down for good, Venom has to destroy the screens throughout the area. So there are a lot of environmental variables at play, and much like the Rhino fight, it adds a lot of dynamism. With Electro out of commission, Venom is free to consume Spider-Man. Until S.H.I.E.L.D. arrives to save the day. S.H.I.E.L.D. is an agency that often deals with superhuman threats. They play a pretty big role in the Ultimate Spider-Man comics, especially their director Nick Fury. Speaking of Nick, he faces down Venom, and Venom makes a run for it. Fury goes to help Spider-Man, but Spidey isn't all too happy. He gives Fury a piece of his mind before swinging off. 
Come on, kiddo, wake up. What are you doing here? Come on, get up. Why can't you keep this electric guy you're supposed to be keeping in prison in prison? And that lady, the silver lady that captured Eddie the other day. Why couldn't she? Peter, you need to call... I need to quit getting almost killed by stupid people is what I need. We don't get to see a whole lot of Peter and Fury's relationship in this game, but what we do get to see is Pitch Perfect. It really highlights their dynamic from the comics well. Fury has a bit of a paternal relationship with Peter, although they often find themselves at odds. The same goes for Peter's relationship with MJ in the game. Although she doesn't get a huge spotlight, the game captures their dynamic really well, with MJ serving as Peter's main support system, and really the only person he can bounce the superhero stuff off of. Trouble brews off the coast, on a shield vessel. The beetle breaks into the ship and secures the Green Goblin, Spider-Man's penultimate villain. Fury finds out, and Agent Carter asks him if he wants to dispatch agents to oversee Peter. Fury hopes to have the matter resolved before Peter ever finds out. In very short order though, Spider-Man comes across the new armored threat. The beetle isn't interested in talking, and he has no qualms about putting innocents in harm's way to make his escape. So much like the encounter with Rhino, Spider-Man has to save civilians that the beetle endangers, all while keeping up. Again, I'd just like to point out how often Spider-Man saves people in this game. He really does come across like a hero. The beetle breaks into a laboratory and paws a sample of Sandman, another one of Spider-Man's villains. Spider-Man gives chase yet again, and the two face off on a construction building. I've got to admit, the fight in hindsight isn't the greatest. It mostly consists of chasing Beetle as he flies around and dive bombing him whenever you get the chance. Not the most riveting or dynamic by any means, but it's not offensively bad either. I like the arena. You're high up in the city rooftops, which feels fitting for a villain as vertical as the Beetle. Similarly, you chase him between levels in the construction area, so you do a lot more swinging and movement in this fight than others. Once the Beetle gets enough of a beating, he escapes. Spider-Man drops to ground level and asks some civilians if they've seen where the beetle has gone. They point to the Latverian embassy. Latveria is a country run by Doctor Doom, one of the big baddies in Marvel. So the beetle ducking into the embassy is not great. Since storming an embassy without knowing what you're getting into isn't the wisest concept, Spider-Man retreats to do some research. This level is filled with cameos and references, and I think they're a strength to the game. References can run the risk of feeling contrived and ruining immersion when not used correctly, but I don't think Ultimate Spider-Man suffers from this pitfall. The reason why is the references and cameos are used with consideration and thought, and therefore they build up the world rather than detract from it. For instance, Doctor Doom's embassy being up to nefarious schemes feels very fitting in-world, as does a sample of Sandman's essence being stored off in a lab somewhere. They build up a level of intrigue, Eddie Brock has returned to Trask. He reveals to Tombs that being in close proximity with Spider-Man makes him feel in control of the suit. He lets slip the name Parker, which is enough to tip Trask off to Spider-Man's identity. Trask figures the connection is important since the suit was built with Richard Parker's DNA. He orders Tombs to get Eddie to share everything. Eddie is aboard a ship with Silver Sable, and he reveals information about Peter. His name is Peter Parker. He lives with his aunt in Queens. He's still in high school. And he'll come to you of his own free will. No, oh, I don't think we have to worry about that. What the hell are you doing? From Sable's comment, it's implied that Eddie convinced them that he could lure Spider-Man out. I assume that's why they let him out of his cell and put him on this ship. Eddie has different plans, though. He wants Peter for himself. He transforms into Venom and tries to kill Sable. They plummet out of the plane in a very cool cutscene. The use of comic panels as framing really shines here. Eddie and Sable duke it out on the streets. She is the most agile villain you face so far as Venom, so she presents a distinct challenge. It's harder to get her into your clutches as she dive rolls and kicks you away. Eddie gets the upper hand though. Sable's reinforcements arrive so Eddie has to fight them and flee. This is the most intense resistance Eddie has faced yet, and it follows a pattern of Venom's levels increasing with enemy density. In this level, it feels like an entire army is bearing down on Venom. While the intensity of these missions provides an increased challenge gameplay-wise, it also reflects the progression of the narrative. 
As Eddie's presence in the city becomes increasingly known, and as he causes more and more trouble, it makes sense that more and more resources would be thrown at his capture or termination. It's a nice melding of gameplay with narrative. Venom makes his escape, leaving Sable with one less ship. Peter talks to MJ, and she leads him to a superhero conspiracy website with information about the Latverians. This showcases MJ's curiosity, as well as her cleverness and investigative instinct. Small characterizations like this go a long way, especially when MJ doesn't get a ton of screen time in the game. One of the theories is that the Latverians have developed a biotactical legion. Peter puts two and two together that the Beatle is a member of it. The dual framing of MJ and Peter is nice. I like being able to see both their perspectives at once, instead of cutting back and forth between them. Another benefit of the comic book styling. Peter gets a call from Nick Fury, who commands Peter to the rooftop. He then commands Peter to back away from the Latverians. However, he knows full well that Peter will do the exact opposite of what he just told him. This is my life! Kid. This is a real intrusion! I need you to back off the Latverian thing. Why? Sorry, kid. 18 and older. What does that mean? It means I need you to back off. Yeah, okay, fine, fine! But this is my life. Don't come here. <laughs> Thanks, kid. General, do you think he'll behave? Knowing Peter Parker the way I do, I'm absolutely sure that he will do the exact opposite of what I just asked him to do. The implication is that Nick Fury is a governmental political body, can't touch the Latvian embassy without considerable political fallout. However, a vigilante like Spider-Man busting in and accomplishing the same goals, well, that's plausible deniability right there. This cutscene speaks to the other half of Nick Fury and Peter's fraught relationship. While Nick Fury can be paternal at times, he also runs a spy agency, and he can be very manipulative at times. It's pretty cool how the game can capture the complexity of their relationship despite their limited interactions. Spider-Man predictably goes against Fury's wishes, and it backfires on him, literally. 18 and over? Huh. How does he think he is? Ah, great! Spidey has to chase the Green Goblin down and save civilians caught in his rampage. The Green Goblin's betrayal here is pretty good, but it leaves me wanting a bit more. The ultimate version of the Green Goblin is my favorite rendition of the villain, along with the 2002 Raimi movie version. In the Ultimate Universe, Spider-Man's powers come from the Oz Serum, rather than radiation. It's a serum created by Norman Osborn, so he views Peter as his creation, and also as his property. It sets up a really interesting dynamic between them, and it isn't one explored in this game. In the game, the Green Goblin is very bestial, and doesn't utter a word of dialogue. You don't get that dynamic here. However, you can argue the Green Goblin in this game is still authentic. Norman is fond of ingesting more of the Oz serum, and he does become pretty bestial if he has a lot of it. I think this was probably the right approach. Trying to fit a more complex Green Goblin with the rest of the narrative would bloat it unnecessarily. And the Ultimate Green Goblin plays such an important role in the Ultimate comics that something would have felt a bit off if he wasn't here. So, all that being said, I'm generally happy with how he's portrayed here. The fight with him is tough. In fact, it's the only boss fight that I died to in the whole game. The Green Goblin is precise with his fireballs, and they're hard to dodge. You need to wait until an opening presents itself before you can attack the Goblin. In this way, the Goblin's physical intensity is expressed. The battles brought indoors, and dodging the Goblin's attacks becomes even tougher. The floor is set on fire, which brings an urgency to the fight. Peter gets the upper hand on his nemesis and takes him out. Shield shows up, but they don't seem quite as grateful as they should be for the rescue. I want a genetic suppressor collar on Osborne three minutes ago. Get this area sealed off inside of ten seconds or I'll fire the first son of a... You with fury? Hmm, good job here. Could you have made a bigger mess? No, and believe me, I tried. Hmm, you've got some mouth on you. Wow. You'd think you'd be a teeny bit nicer considering I just did your job for you. Meanwhile, the beetle isn't done with his nefarious schemes yet. He tracks down Venom and requires a sample. Venom doesn't stand for getting tossed around, so he gives the beetle chase. 
and they square up in a warehouse. This fight against the beetle works better than the Spider-Man encounter. The enclosed area plus Venom's ability to attack from range with his tendrils makes the boss more of a fight and less of a chase. What I also liked about the boss is the setting and the context it provides. The beetle sets off traps in the warehouse. It's clear that he has been preparing for this encounter with Venom. Eddie wasn't chasing the beetle to this warehouse, he was being lured there. The beetle doesn't get much characterization in this game, but this detail highlights his meticulous precise nature. The beetle is defeated, so Venom leaves the scene. This is the last of the beetle we'll get in the game. Although he isn't a threat anymore, the Ladvarian subplot is left hanging. I don't think this is a bad thing. I think the subplot added a level of intrigue to the world, but fully plunging down that rabbit hole would have been a distracting detour. Instead, it serves a similar purpose to the cameos, in communicating the larger world that Spider-Man and his rogues gallery inhabit. You get the sense that these are leads that S.H.I.E.L.D. is probably better equipped to track down. Spider-Man just gets caught up in some of the events. With Spider-Man's identity discovered, Silver Sable tracks down Peter and kidnaps him. He comes too quickly, though, and he breaks out when crossing over the Queensboro Bridge. Sable blasts him with a few more tranquilizers before commanding him to get back into the car. Peter refuses and they duke it out. I love how tough Peter is here. He's just tanking through who knows how much tranquilizer, still taking on Sable and her band of mercs. Peter doesn't have access to his web shooters, so his reduced capacity is reflected gameplay-wise as well. Their tussle results in car crashes on the bridge, so Peter stops what he's doing and helps the civilians. What's most interesting though is Sable does the same thing. She helps Peter save the civilians. I love this moment. It shows that although Sable's a mercenary, she isn't evil. The game is great at adding these small character flourishes, especially to characters that don't get a lot of screen time. It gives them depth, or at least alludes to it. This highlights the importance of Brian Michael Bendis writing the script. Although some characters might only show up in the game for a handful of minutes, he had been writing Ultimate Spider-Man for years when this game came out. He knows which part of their personalities to highlight to make the most of their screen time. After the civilians are saved, Sable is happy to resume their fight. She blasts Spidey with a few more tranquilizers before their shared enemy shows up. You're just gonna stand there? Thinking about it. This little moment is quintessentially Peter, although he doesn't really want to help the lady that kidnapped him. He will. So Spider-Man chases Venom through the city. This segment is gorgeous. The sunset lighting shows the cel-shaded graphics in their best light. The fact that I can find a game from almost 20 years ago so beautiful really speaks to their art design. Spider-Man and Venom face off once more. This time, Spider-Man has to protect Sable. Eddie has a few new tricks up his sleeves, such as launching cars at Spider-Man. Spidey's acute headaches are still an issue, as he'll freeze up during combat. Still, with some persistence and grit, Venom goes down. The tranquilizer finally catches up with Peter, and he goes down too. Silver Sable wakes up and seizes the opportunity. Eddie regains consciousness in his familiar cell. He isn't alone very long. Someone, or something, breaks into his cell. A red and black monster. Carnage. Eddie recognizes him immediately as Peter, due to his suit's connection with him. Mark Bagley's ultimate design for Carnage is my favorite. The yellow eyes, despite glowing, are just so dead and vacant. And he's honestly one of the most terrifying villains I've seen. If you read the Carnage arc in the comics, you'll see why I think that. It reads more like a horror story than anything else. And the fact that Peter was turned into this monstrosity is even more ghoulish. He's a mindless husk. This is exemplified by the creepy sounds Carnage makes when he and Eddie begin to fight. This is a real fight of endurance, as both Venom and Carnage can heal themselves. You trade punches back and forth, battling through Trask Industries in a bid to win. This battle culminates in a large research facility. On the far wall, there are schematics for the Rhino suit, and it's a nice detail that calls back to prior in the game. Carnage and Venom's tug of war continues. You need to balance between chasing down Carnage when he heals and persisting damage, while also retreating to heal yourself by feeding on the scientists. Once Carnage is defeated, there's a flashback, where we see Tombs experimenting on Peter. Ugh, 
What's going on? Where am I? Tell me, Mr. Parker. Did you ever wear the Venom suit yourself? What is this? Did you wear the suit? W once. Only for a few hours. Hmm. It appears that the suit bonded itself to you. I it's amazing you've survived any encounter with Eddie Brock at all. The microscopic suit particles in you want to join with the suit Brock wears. Fascinating. Hmm. Let's see if we can help them. In case this kills you, I, I want you to know I think your father was a genius. Ten years ahead of the curve. Status? Eddie consumes carnage and spits Peter back out. This all comes together nicely. Peter's headaches were due to the venom particles in the system wanting to rejoin Eddie. Tomb serum enhanced the venom suit particles, so when Eddie consumed carnage, the missing parts of the suit were rejoined with him. The joining grants Eddie complete control over the suit. With this control, Eddie's first order of business is getting revenge on Trask. Peter gets to him first, and he demands Trask give him information on his father. Venom arrives shortly after, and Trask runs while Peter fights Venom. They reach the rooftop, and Peter encounters Sable again. You again? Down, boy. My contract with Trask expired ten minutes ago. And if you're chasing him, don't worry. He doesn't know how to fly that helicopter. But you... Eh, no hard feelings. Business is business, eh? This encounter works really well. It's funny, but it also highlights Sable's personality. She was here for the paycheck, not for any loyalty to Trask. Based on how she refers to him, he is clearly a man that she doesn't have a whole lot of respect for, so she leaves Spider-Man to his own devices. This goes back to what I was saying about those sprinkles of characterization, and how they really are more than the sum of their parts. So Peter and Eddie fight one last time. This is my favorite part of the game. I love the atmosphere of the battle, with the pouring rain and lightning searing the sky in the background. I love how they're fighting over a man both of them disdain, with Peter trying to save him and Eddie after revenge. Peter and Eddie are both at full strength. Peter doesn't have the headaches anymore, so no more getting blindsided during battle. The fight is far from a cakewalk, however. There are a few elements which really drive the intensity. Eddie takes breaks from fighting with Peter to knock Trask's helicopter off the ledge. He'll do it fairly quickly too if Peter lets him. At the same time, the fire Trask started progresses throughout the battle, diminishing the fightable area. So you feel pressure on both sides, and you need to manage both the helicopter and also be wary of the fire. Eventually, Spider-Man wins the day. With Eddie down for the count, Spider-Man is finally free to read Trask's files. It was over. Now I can learn everything that Trask knew about what happened ten years ago. Burn it. We'll start new. Peter, I have all these things in my head, things I want to say. <laughs> Things I think is your father you'll need to hear. You're going to find that there are people in this world, people who you are going to look at and say, why is this person like this? I find myself surrounded by people who will do or say anything just for the appearance that they are better than they are. There were three survivors of the crash. They all reported seeing the same thing. One of the witnesses was my mother. She died in the ambulance. Richard Parker's narration here is a great callback to the Venom arc from the comics. The saga essentially starts off with Peter finding old recordings that his dad left for him. So seeing their presence here ties a great bow on the end of the saga. And while Peter was reading, Eddie escaped. And he has one last job to do. And with that, Ultimate Spider-Man is over. Ultimate Spider-Man is a short game. I think my playthrough clocked in at 3 hours, and I didn't exactly speedrun it. You could make an argument that the game was too short, especially when it was full priced at release. However, I'm not all that interested in talking about whether an 18 year old game was worth its price at launch. As a kid at that time, I certainly got my money's worth and then some. Now I think the game's length is perfect, and it's one of its strengths actually. Ultimate Spider-Man was known for popularizing writing for the trade paperback format. Essentially, the stories were organized into distinct arcs, around 5 to 8 issues each, all around a story with a distinct beginning, middle, and end. For instance, the original Venom arc is one such example. 
which originally comprised issues 33 through 39. They formed volume 6 of the trade paperback collection. The Ultimate Spider-Man game doesn't feel like a long grand epic. Instead, it feels like another trade paperback volume, which can be inserted neatly into the comic series. I think this was the design behind it too. Each chapter in the game starts with a comic book cover designed for the games, which looks exactly like a cover from the comics. In fact, it sits atop a pile of real Ultimate Spider-Man comics, reinforcing the idea that the level you're playing is just one more issue from the comics. If you took all the chapters and their covers and turned each into an actual comic book issue, you really would have just another trade paperback volume. In fact, this game was actually adapted into the comics through the War of the Symbiote storyline. Although I think the story is less effective than the game. It's a testament to the games, its quality, and how true it is to the comics. How many games are adapted from the source material, then the source material adapts the game. The game holds up for me. When playing Ultimate Spider-Man again, I experience a joy I haven't experienced when gaming in a long time. It's a very pure sort of joy. The joy of jumping into a world that means so much to me. Of that world being brought to life in such a true and authentic way. In that way, this game is a gift to me, and that might be the best way to describe it. The game is a gift to those that love the comics and the character. Delivering joy like that, it's what playing games is all about at the end of the day, right? And that wraps up my love letter to this game. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please consider liking, subscribing, and ringing the bell. Or if you're so inclined, please check out my Northfield series. Until next time.